Your life can change. It doesn't have to stay the same. You can break through to another level. You can experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower you to live beyond limits. Good morning. How's everyone doing? They said, oh, the parking lot's full. I'm like, ooh, somebody told them Pastor Brad's out of town. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we had Pastor Brad sent me this. You know, we love to share TikToks. I like to share funny ones. Of course, Pastor Brad wants to share serious ones, but this is great. So let's pay attention to the screen for just a moment. Yes, it's true. Going to church does have immense positive benefits throughout your life. A new survey out shows something really interesting. A Baylor University religious study found that when children went to church weekly at the age of 12, the amount of positive outcomes in their life as adults were numerous. It's important to note that this wasn't going to church sporadically, it was weekly. And we see the same kind of outcomes with adults that go to church weekly now, it cannot be sporadic. It's that weekly persistent dedication and attendance that ultimately makes the difference in mental health outcomes and even economic and relational outcomes. So people that went to church weekly at the age of 12 are much more likely today as adults to say they are very happy. They're also a lot less likely to say they're bored. What's fascinating is the medium uh, age of those who answered the survey was 57. So we're talking about decades and decades later, this habit of going to church on a weekly basis has affected their lives in this incredibly powerful way for so many years. Childhood religiosity is a majorly important thing. Honestly, there are more good stories than bad stories, and that's really important to remember. So if you're thinking about taking your kids to church, the answer is yes. That's all I got. Love to share this kind of data. I think it's so important. So let me know what you think. Church is important. Church is important. You know, it... You And, and hey, I think... I love that we're in the age to where you can watch church online, at home, wherever you are. But do you know, it does not replace coming together. Like the worship this morning, coming together and being in God's presence. There's nothing that replaces that. And it's good to wake up, be faithful, and go to bed. Amen? Church is important. Well, we're going to continue uh, our series. Pastor Brad started last week about faith, and we're going to just get jump right into the Word of God today. And Father, we just thank you for our time together this morning. We just ask that, Father, you open our hearts and our minds to the Word of God today, that, Father, you're giving us understanding of the Word, that we're growing and increasing in you, and that our faith is continuing to grow and to be challenged in, in the Word, Father. Father, and we just thank you that we hear your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to talk about overcomer, overcoming hindrances to faith. In 1 John 5, 4, it says, for, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world to our faith. So true faith is overcoming faith. The thing that empowers us to move forward in the face of obstacles and overcome things in this world is our faith in God. In this passage that I just read, Apostle John declared that our victory over the world is in our faith. The only thing that enables us to stand against things in the world and against the devil is our unwavering faith in Jesus. I love this morning that uh, Ed kept saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That is where the power is. Amen. So the only thing that will enable us to stand in the day, in the evil day, is our unwavering faith in the name of Jesus. This is why each of the seven letters in the Chronicles of Revelation, where it is written, those who overcome, when we preserve and overcome by faith to the very end, then we live a faith that is worthy of the rapture. Amen? It's worthy of the rapture and of the reward in the life to come. In John 10, 10, everybody knows this scripture. The thief, does not come, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you know that's the thief? When things happen in our life, that is the devil. That is the thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's not God's will for that. That is the thief. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. 
Jesus taught us that he wants us to have abundant life. He wants more for us than to have to just take it from the devil. You don't have to take it because he's come to give you life more abundantly. In contrast, the devil comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. One of the things that Satan has to do in order for destruction in your life is he attacks your faith. That's the way he gets in, is to attack your faith. So if he can weaken our faith and get us to doubt, then he has an opening to us. Our defense against the strategy of the devil is to build our faith in God, in the confidence of God. You know, I spoke a couple weeks ago about in the meantime, and I talked about trusting God. You can't trust somebody you don't know. You can't have strong faith in something, in someone you don't know. It is so important to study the Word. That's why it's important to come to church. Amen? It's important to bring your kids to church. Because they're learning and they're growing. It's important to be here on Wednesday nights. Plug for the youth ministry. Why? Because it's important to, to grow in the Word and to learn and to receive it on the level that, where you are. That's why children's church and youth ministry is so important. Your kids are dealing with things and they're facing things in life. They need to get the Word on their level. It's important, parents. If Satan can throw his best at us and our faith remains strong and unwavering, then he loses the fight because he's going to come after you. Some people think, well, you know, the Christian life, I'm not going to have to deal with that. That's not true. The Word tells us that he's going to come to steal, kill, and destroy. But you have something else to look to. Amen. You know, Pastor Brad taught us last week about knowledge, sense knowledge, faith, and revelation faith. Sense knowledge consents, consults the senses. It's the natural things. But revelation faith is faith that is rooted in the revelation of who Jesus is. Revelation faith knows that, what, that we are what God says we are because he is who he says he is. And you can believe that when you're in the facing situations and circumstances. Amen. Everything God would ever bless us with was made available to us the moment that Jesus died on the cross. That very moment, he was your substitute. He died on the cross and was seated at the right hand in heavenly places. Our faith must be founded in the spiritual reality rather than in natural circumstances. So we've got to get out of just the senses and move into the knowledge, as Pastor Brad spoke on that last week. We must continue to look to the Word of God and confess the Word over our lives so that it gains supremacy, so it becomes the top of everything in our life. If we're going to have overcoming faith, then we must overcome the hindrances of faith. So I'm going to talk today a few examples of some hindrance of faith. Number one is lack of understanding. You know, sometimes lack of understanding just comes, comes because you don't have knowledge of things. Again, study the Word so that you have knowledge. Faith never rises above its confession. I want you to get that. Faith will never rise above its confession. The fact is, if we confess weakness, sickness, doubt, and unbelief, that's going to destroy your faith. When we boldly make confessions about sickness, about disease, it doesn't mean you're not going to face those things. But when you boldly make a confession about something that you are facing and you bring it to God, you open the door for God to intervene on your behalf and in your situation in your life. It's often the lack of knowledge and understanding that hinders us. And it hinders us from making the right confession about things. Faith grows with the understanding of God's Word. It's so important to study the Word. You know, and it's easy now. You've got an app. You can just put it on and listen to it. You don't even have to read it. But it's important to be hearing it and understanding it and learning it. The lack of understanding that Christians suffer is from knowledge that Christ has redeemed you and set you at high on heavenly places. 
You've been redeemed through the name of Jesus. We are a new creation. You are a new creation in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. The moment you were born again, you became a part of a new race. The very moment you said, Jesus, you'll be the Lord of my life, you became a new creation in him. The lack of understanding of a new creation is what hinders our faith. You know, sometimes some of us have been saved. I've been saved since I was a little kid. I don't even remember getting saved. I got saved so long ago. I have lived my whole life in church serving Jesus. So sometimes we have to be reminded. That's what these kind of messages are for. They're to build your faith, to challenge you, to help bring it back. You know, in school, you sometimes go back to the basics, and you start building upon it and building upon it. These are the basics. You are a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The moment we are born again, we become a part of a new race. That's so good. It's being saved to a new creation life and the realities and the benefits that come with that. So when you became saved, you didn't only just become a new man, you also have all these other things that are opened up to you. You ask, it's not just forgiveness of sin. You now have a power and authority on the inside of you that you did not have before. It's not just the promise of living with God forever, but it is the quality of life to enjoy God's promises. The life of God is in us. That is why the power of God is in us, and it is greater than the adversary. It's greater than the devil and anything that he could ever throw at you. New creation means God inside me. So he's living on the inside of you. The creator of the universe, of the heavens and earth, lives on the inside of you. That's a lot of power, living on just the little old me. In Galatians 2.20, says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, people have this basic understanding about and it's, it can be almost a religion, like, okay, yeah, I accepted. You know, Jesus, you accepted Jesus. It's great. But, you know, it's way more than a religion. This is a lifestyle. This is, this is life. This is everything. It's not just, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, just religion in itself. But when you don't get the reality of it and you look at it as just, that's religion. That's just, you know, it's all up here. It's hard to take it and put it in your everyday life, but that's what it is. It's not religion. It's for you to live day to day. The life of God is living in you, and it's powerful. Amen? We are the righteousness of God. Do you know when when Jesus died and he was risen, he was seated at the right hand with the Father? Do you know you are seated at the right hand in heavenly places with the Father? My father-in-law was just amazing uh, at preaching about the righteousness of God. It's because he lived in religion for so many years, and then when he got a hold of who they were, it changed, it changed their life, changed their direction of ministry. We get a hold of the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. The moment we put our faith in Jesus for salvation, we become the righteousness of God. We stand redeemed and righteous in the sight of God. You are worthy. You are good enough. You know, religion teaches that you can't ever be good enough. But that's not what the Word says. That's why it's important who you listen to and the words you're listening to. Our faith is a redemptive work of Christ. It gives birth to a new creation life that causes us and allows us to stand in the righteousness of God.
That's so good. We're not sinners saved by grace. You're not a sinner saved by grace. We were sinners, but we were saved by his grace, and you were made righteous with him. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Knowing that we are the righteousness of God gives us the authority and the power to our faith to overcome the weaknesses and the false humility of religion. You're made to overcome that, and you don't have to live under that. We have a right to use the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the most powerful name you can use. You know, and I want to encourage you, if you don't know what to say, if you're in a situation and something, and you don't know what to say, just say Jesus. Just call on the name. Jesus. Jesus. Call on his name. It'll bring peace to you. It'll bring a calm to the storm. Speak the name. As a part of our new creation race that stands righteous before God, it is the right to, we have the right to use the name of Jesus. It has been given to us. It is our right to use it. And there is authority in that name. We have a legal right to it. And when you say the name of Jesus, every demon, every sickness, anything the devil comes your way has to stop because of the name of Jesus. There is authority and power in that name. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Not knowing that we have a legal right to this and to use the name of Jesus can keep you bound. But you're not bound. You are free. When we know the authority that we've been given to use the name, we can defeat Satan at every turn and enjoy the victory that's been given to us. This has already been given to you. You can stand boldly and declare you know, when you know something, you, you, you're more confident in it. You're like, mm -mm, no, that's not right. No, this is what it is, right? It gives you confidence. When you know the word, it gives you confidence. When you know whose you are and who's living in you, it gives you confidence to face anything. Doesn't mean you won't be shaken. You can be shaken at times. But you got to say, hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Mm-mm. You have the authority and the one who created the heavens and the earth living on the inside of you. You don't have to stay shaken. Once we know who we are in Christ, the rights that have been given to us, we need to act on them. Because that's obeying his word. He gave it to you to act on it, to obey it. The truth is our faith keeps pace with our confession. That's good. I'm going to say it again for those in the back. The truth is our faith keeps pace with our confession. Our faith grows as we declare God's word. The more you say it, the more you study it, the more confident you get. But your faith is going to stay where your confession is. Another way to overcome hindrances is to realize there's two types of confessions. So our faith is measured by our confession, but the reality is sooner or later we're going to become what we confess. Just like there's two kinds of faith, there's two kinds of confession. There's a confession of the heart and a confession of the mouth. The confession of the heart is your inner man, your spirit man. Faith is never born in the flesh or in the mind, but it's born in your spirit. That's where it starts, is in your spirit, not in your mind. The confession of the heart 
desires to speak the word in faith. Now, the confession of the mouth is often by our feelings or our flesh. We just say things without really thinking. I know nobody's ever done that. You ever said something just like, like, and then you're like, I shouldn't have said that. We have a tendency to speak what we feel or what we see instead of our heart confession, what our spirit knows. Have you ever seen something before you or something happens in your life and you're like, wait a minute, but your spirit knows something different. That's the difference. So it's what you're giving into there. That's what counts. The Bible declares out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As we grow strong in our faith and our inner man, then our faith-filled words can be declared out of our mouth. Again, knowing the word. What are you filling your spirit with? What are you spending your time filling your spirit with? And I'm all about, you can go have fun. I'm not, we're not, trust me, we're not at our house sitting and praying all the time and studying the word all the time. We're living life. I work, Pastor Brad works. We have two very active children. (laughs) We have a crazy dog. We have a lot going on, but we have to make time for the word. And you have to take time to fill your spirit with something. Because that's what's going to come out. When we confess, when the confession of our mouth and the confession of our heart are aligned, when they come together, it confirms the Word of God. And then it'll change your life and it'll change your prayer life. So when your spirit and your mouth come together, and they will, it's possible, they will. When you get your, when you spend time in the Word and you spend time in church, it'll change you. You know, an example of this is when a sinner is born again. So they, they come to the moment, what do you do? You say, okay, I'm going to speak, I'm going to confess. Now, they don't usually know anything right at the way, you know, sometimes people have been to, maybe you've witnessed to somebody or they're going through something or they come to church and then, yes, they're going to accept Jesus. They've heard a little bit about him. So this is where it's the same thing. They say, oh, yeah, okay, their heart desires Jesus. And then they're going to confess it with their mouth. It's the same way. It's the same, the same dynamic of faith is required to do that, to accept Jesus as it is to live your life every day. It's simple. That's why I love the Word of God. It's easy. It's made for everybody. It doesn't have to be difficult. It's made for even the simplest. (laughs) Too often people develop a habit of negative confession. They talk about constantly, talk about what they see or this. Or you've heard people say, that's just killing me. Now, I know most people are like, I mean, that's just an expression. I know, but you're saying it. You're, you're saying it. You know, we, uh, and Mikkel told this story Wednesday night, and I could relate about her kids calling each other stupid. And I know because my kids do that too. But I'm like, don't call each other stupid. You don't call each other names. We don't call each other names, Period. Now, that's for me to call your dad names. No, I'm just teasing. We don't call each other names except good things. Why? Because you're confessing it out. You're saying it. So it's important what you're saying. You don't want to let a bad confession out of your mouth. And you'll live by the level of your confession. You're going to live by the level of your confession. A spiritual law uh, few have recognized is that our confessions rule us. They determine where you're going and where you're in life, where you're going. It's by the confessions and the things you're saying about yourself. You know, and I've said this before, and, you know, it's amazing to me that I hear um, it's not even, they're not even spiritual people. I don't know if they're even saved, but you hear just doctors and, and you know, 
life coaches or whatever, and they say things about what you say, what you, what you think, and what you say about yourself and your situation is what you believe. It doesn't matter what somebody else tells you. What you think and what you say is what you believe. That's why you're going to live to the level of your confession. So it's important what we say and what we think. Next one, number three, is the right confession. I told you about the wrong confession. Now it's the right confession. John 12, 49 says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. You know, everything that Jesus said were the words from the Father. They were the words the Father gave him to say. The scripture states that people marveled how Jesus spoke with authority. The authority of his words were the result of declaring the words of his heavenly Father. That's what he spoke. The healings that Jesus performed, the demons he cast out, he was using the authority. He was using God's authority. That's what he was speaking. He knew who he was. He knew his place. He knew where he was going. And he knew the words he was spoken needed to be his father's words. And we need to do that. We need to speak our father's words. What does the word say? That's what we need to be speaking. Jesus not only used his power of his words to confess who he was, but also what man would be in him as a new creation. He also spoke about you and what you would be. In John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, Jesus made confessions and declarations about himself. And in John 5, 19 through 30, I'm not going to read all that because it's a lot. But there's 10 confessions that Jesus made in here that links him with the deity. I'll read through them quickly. Number one, whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. The Father, the Father loves the Son and shows him all things and greater things to come. The Son gives life. The Father has committed all judgment to the Son. All should honor the Son as as they honor the Father. He who believes in me shall have everlasting life. The dead will hear the voice of the Son and live. The Father has granted life to the Son. The faith has given the Son authority. My judgment is righteous. Jesus made declarations about himself. How much more should we de declare and confess the word of God? If he was doing it and declaring these things about himself, how much more should we be doing that? And declaring that over our lives and our situations and our circumstances that we're in. And number four is the wrong confession. The wrong confession imprisons us and the right confession sets us free. It's not only our thinking, but our words that build power and weakness in us. Our words either snare us and hold us captive, or they can propel you and be powerful in your life. We talk what we believe. You, you talk what you believe. If we talk sickness, then we believe sickness. If we talk doubt and unbelief and we, we, we poor mouth and we this and we that and we always have something negative to say, that is what we believe. It's important what we say and not to say the wrong confession. It's amazing that faith can get you out of a situation and get you out of circumstances. What we believe in determines the confession that we make. What are you believing in? What do you put your trust in? Our confession can add to the strength of our weakness if we continually confess it. It'll strengthen you. What you say will strengthen you. In Luke 8, 11, it's the parable of the sower. It says, now the parable is this, the seed was the word of God. 
Just as I love that illustration that Darren was given today. Why would God put that in there? I told you, God makes it simple so you can understand it. Everybody gets that. You plant something, it's going to grow. And I'm not a gardener. I don't even have plants. But I know that what's, I know what's supposed to happen. If you plant something, it's going to grow. Our words are the seeds we sow into our lives and into others' lives. We're sowing seeds when we're speaking. While others sow seeds of sense knowledge faith, we must be sure to sow, sow seeds of revelation faith. Not what we feel, but what we know. Our words give birth to faith or to doubt. Overcoming faith is faith that speaks victoriously because in its agreement with the Word of God. Get your mouth in line with the Word of God. Revelation 12, 11 says, They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. What is your testimony? Are you healed? And now, you know what? The biggest thing I love is that when people are, you know people are going through things, but yet their confessions don't wane. Those are the people you need to be around. God created with the words, and, and most of the people Jesus healed were with words. It's what he spoke. What you speak is so important. I can't say that enough. Satan is overcome by the words that you speak. Hebrews 3, 1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the high priest of your confession. He is the power and the authority behind your confession and the things that you are saying. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We must hold fast our confession of our faith in Jesus. Our confessions rule us. They actually make your world around you. Watch what you say at home. Watch what you allow to fill the atmosphere of your home. Make it a place of peace. Speak peace. Your kids won't want to come home if it's not a place of peace. I can't get my kids to go anywhere. You'd think they would learn to cook because I'm always wanting to go out to eat. And they're like, no, let's go home. I'm like, are you cooking? What are you cooking? I'm not cooking. Who's cooking? They love to go home. I love that they love to go home. I wish they'd love to go home after we went out to eat. But they love to be at home. But I take it it's because it's a place of peace and comfort for them. It's their haven. Just like your church. Why it's important to be in church. It's your haven. It's your place. If you're feeling down, you come and you get strengthened. Amen. You have faith. You don't need to pray for faith. You already have faith. God's already given you faith. We just have to use the faith that we have. Work it, in a sense. You know, nothing comes easy. You have to actually work for things. It's not just going to fall in your lap. You've got to work it to grow it, to make it powerful in your life. Remember, we are done, we have, what we are doing with our, we are made, you either make it or break it with a confession. What you say is so important. So we want to be positive in what we're saying. And that's not just all that positive thinking and all that. No, like we said earlier, you're going to face things because that is life, but it's how you face them. You've been given instructions. You've been given authority. You don't have to face them on your own. Amen? Let's stand. 
That was just a little teaching. Faith is, you know, I, you need faith for everything. Everything. So this is our, just our teaching. I love, like, as I said, going back to the basics. You know, it's good to, to be reminded of the Word and what the Word says. Amen. Well, Father God, we just thank you. We praise you today, Father. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we could be made righteous and we could be in right standing with you, Father. That you've given all the power and the authority in you, you've placed in us, Father. Holy Spirit, help us to study your word. Open our eyes to the understanding of your word so that we can, we can grow in you, Father. Help us to understand the authority and the power that is in the name of Jesus. You've made us to overcome, Father. We thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. That you're strengthening us today. And that our hope is in you. You know, we serve a God that gives hope. You're never without hope. And we thank you, Father God, that when we speak the name of Jesus, things happen. Things happen. Things change. And we're going to give our altar call for those of you that don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If he's not your heavenly father, he wants to be. And it's easy. As I said, the, the word of God is simple. Why he made it that way for us. Because he's not some huge deity up there that we can't. He is, he's here to live inside of you and to give you abundant life. So let's all pray this together. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe that your son died for me and that he rose again. I ask you to come and live in my heart. Make me clean. Wash me, wash me clean, Father. And I thank you that I'm not only clean, but that I'm seated at the right hand with you, Father. I give my life to you. I will serve you, Lord. Amen. Praise God. God is good. The right confession. Watch your confessions and the words that you're saying. It's important. It's important to be at church and in the house of God, surrounded by people of like faith. Amen. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for sharing the ministry of Surge Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you. Stay connected together. We will surge.